everyone. Our next speaker is Marian Hule, and he will talk about trusted automated reasoning. Uh, thanks, uh, Alex. So uh, it's very nice to, to talk here about uh, this, this uh, important topic. Randy already introduced and motivated it quite a bit. So I will, uh, so I will talk about it as well. I will illustrate various things using some uh, mathematical examples. Uh, I make sure that there's no overlap with the talk I gave uh, two weeks ago here, but there is there is some overlap, at least a bit of the, um, the talk I gave in Berkeley uh, earlier this week. Um, so, but I will go more into detail here. So that was more a higher level. So let me start with this slide that my, many of you have already seen. Uh, when we submitted the, so posted the Pythagorean triples result on archive, we were contacted by Nature. Uh, I tried to explain to her in 70 minutes why this it was so important that we could trust the results. And, but none of that got into the article, right? It's more that this is somehow a, an honor, but it's quite a dubious honor of making the, the largest mathematics proof. Uh, and of course, as all of you know, it's very easy to make it larger, just making the heuristic work slightly less. Um, and, uh, but the cool thing, uh, so I think the, the positive story here is that even if the proofs are 200 terabytes in size or the, for the sure number five, it's even uh, two petabytes in size, we can validate these proofs and we can validate them using formally verified checkers. So I think this is all about the trust uh, story and as Randy already mentioned, this turned out to be quite addictive. So you, once you have a proof for something, you want to have a proof of everything. And um, so that's also what I've been pursuing. You probably have all seen this. So you have just kind of four introduction slides, um, but so for everybody that did not see this problem. So uh, the big proof came from the five and triples problem. Um, Jack already mentioned this uh, regarding Rado numbers. Uh, so we want to color the positive integers with two colors. Let's call them red and blue, such there is no monochromatic solution of the, the equation a squared plus b squared is c squared. You can easily do this up till 40 by hand. It's just if the number is a, a, a single prime factor of five or seven, it is uh, blue and otherwise it's red and you can easily make easy constructions up till even a, a couple of thousand but uh, uh, things get hard at 7,000 so uh, almost a decade ago uh, Cooper and Overstreet actually two students of Graham uh, were able to or former students were able to uh, get to 7,664 and Myers actually in his thesis conjecture that you could do this indefinitely just kind of for everybody here is kind of kind of natural how we would translate this into propositional logic. We go find a finite counterexample for a range from one to n, and for each number in the range, we introduce a propositional variable xi. If i is assigned to true, of xi is assigned to true, it means i is red, and if xi is assigned to false, uh, i is color blue. And for each Pythagorean triple, we have two clauses, one stating at least one of A or B is B or C is red, and at least one of A or B or C is blue. Right? So this problem is extremely easy to uh, convert to propositional logic in contrast to several of the others I will talk about. And the result that we had was you can call the numbers 1 to 7,824, but you cannot go beyond that. And actually, this result over here can now be done by local search in 30 seconds, right? Uh, so if Cooper and Overstreet would have used kind of the state of the art local search, they would have also been able to reproduce this result. Uh, Armin tried to reproduce this result using uh, Lingaling. Uh, he ran it 12 core of Lingaling for uh, 300 days on a 12 core machine. And then there was a, power outage and he didn't want to restart. Uh, this was done using uh, on the on the, on the UT Austin cluster in four CPU years, but in two days running 800 cores. If we had the entire cluster, then we could have done it in uh, half an hour. Right? But the important thing is, so 
not that the proof is that big, but that we can verify them validated using formally verified checkers. And we actually have now four, four formally verified checkers, one in ACL2, one in COC, Isabel, and KML, that actually check this. And one exciting thing is also that not only that this community or the broader kind of automated reasoning community is interested in, it's much broader and even fields medalists are now interested in this. Uh, so, uh, and that wasn't used not to be the case. For example, uh, the Pythagorean triples proof, uh, Gowers mentioned on this blog that it's the most disgusting proof ever. Um, uh, but he was also one of the co-organizers of a workshop that we had two months ago uh, at IPAM on machine assisted proofs and also Terry Tao. And so there's a lot of excitement about using uh, machine learning, automated reasoning to find proofs for mathematical problems. Okay, so that was the introduction. I will talk about three topics. Uh, first, I will explain, okay, how, how did we make this all possible, right? And it's not, not, uh, not at uh, all that trivial. Then I would like to talk about going beyond uh, proof checking. We actually not only do the, the proofs uh, tell us whether the results was correct or not, there's actually quite some things you can get out of it. And uh, this is one thing that we are kind of also working on now, how to get even further trust in the whole tool chain. So this is a slide I borrowed from Randy. All right. So what we're going to do is, so you have your propositional formula, you give it to a SAT solver and it produces a proof of unsatisfiability that can be checked, right? And this works because the proof checker is a much more simple program and ideally formally verified. Right. So this idea was already, as Randy mentioned, uh, in 2003, there were two groups that already worked on this. Uh, so the idea was already there, but it took kind of a decade before we could really make it happen such that uh, this could be done efficiently. So I would like the coming slides to focus on the two most important challenges that were kind of that were in between 2003 and 2013 that prevented people from really adopting this technology. And one of the key things was is that top tier solvers like Catechol and Kisset, but back then Lingaling, use kind of a, about a dozen techniques that go uh, beyond resolution. <coughs> or some of them uh, modify solutions, remove solutions, they add solutions, and some of them allow exponential speedups. Right? One thing that we didn't wanna do is, okay, everything that's not resolution, just turn it off, and then uh, you have your proof, right? And what we really wanted to do, and uh, this was when I uh, started as a postdoc with Armin, we want to have a single proof rule that, uh, does everything. Can we do all of the reasoning in a SAT solver using a single rule? Yeah. Now, uh, although many of you saw this, I uh, uh, first want to kind of talk about this kind of informally. So what is a proof? So before going into, into details, what is a proof? A proof is simply a sequence of clauses that is redundant with respect to the formula and the sequence ends at the empty clause. And this is similar what, uh, so what Randy taught in the morning. So what is redundant? We have the strongest notion of redundancy. A clause is redundant with respect to a formula if adding it to the formula preserves satisfiability. Yeah? In that sense, so in this strongest notion of redundancy, if we have an unsatisfiable formula, everything is redundant, right? Because everything you add doesn't change satisfiability. Uh, of course, the other important thing is that you should be able to check this uh, property in polynomial time. And of course, that, that, uh, that is kind of the trick. How can we have strong notions of redundancy that can be checkable in polynomial time? And I want to explain this using the formula over here. So this formula is very simple and it's satisfiable, but I think it's much easier to explain this using a satisfiable formula than uh, using unsatisfiable formula. So we have this simple formula and it has just two solutions, right? B is true and A can be either true or false. 
And what the, the things that SOT solvers are able to do is add clauses that remove solutions. And so what a solver could do is add a clause like this. And so if we add this clause to the formula, the number of solutions goes from uh, two to one. And the question is, okay, how are we going to check that reasoning in a solver that adds a clause like this is valid? So again, this is just the informal definition and the example. And the key thing to make it all work is that we only have a single proof rule. And the single proof rule is the one shown on the slides. So, and I actually use uh, Jacob's notation. Uh, so if we have a formula gamma and a clause C, a clause C is redundant with respect to a formula gamma if uh, there exists an assignment such that the following holds. What, what is stated here, if we have an assignment that satisfies the formula, but falsifies the clause, then we can turn this into an assignment that satisfies the formula and the clause using the assignment. Now, uh, let me kind of explain to you what is probably the easiest thing to see why this holds, is that say, assume that gamma is satisfiable and so gamma and C is satisfiable because that's, that's what we require. So if gamma and C is satisfiable, then there exists a satisfying assignment for gamma and C. And if there's a satisfying assignment tau, then this simplifies to the empty formula and then this trivially holds. Right. But what we're interested in is, okay, what are uh, redundancy properties with a tau that is not a full assignment? Right? Because this would actually mean that we actually solve the full formula and this is not going to help us with uh, 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 solving things. So what we have, and so people that know DRAT is so tau is in DRAT restricted to just an assignment to a single variable. And so what we have in the, in the competitions, we have this rule where this is simplified to unit propagation, where tau is restricted to the assignment to a single Boolean variable. And let me just show the, the, you the example. So if we plug in this for this example, then we have, <coughs> this is our formula. This is the negation of our clause. And this is the formula and the clause. And now under the assignment A to be true. So that means we remove all the clauses satisfied and remove all the falsified literals that simplifies this into this, which is a subset of the formula. And therefore, uh, and we can check, for example, a subset uh, efficiently. Yeah. So just to give you kind of a high level that everything is possible using the single rule. And, uh, and so we only need a checker that is able to check this. And so we have a long proof, say terabytes in size, but just a single rule that can be checked. Now, let me kind of explain to you what is possible using kind of this single rule, right? And Randy mentioned this as a simple math problem. And it, of course it is a simple math problem, uh, but I think it's a very nice illustration of what's possible. So which is the mutilated chessboard? What is the, this problem? We have a chessboard and we take away the opposite corner cells. And we ask whether the remaining grid can be, co can be covered with dominoes that cover two cells or two squares. What's the answer? What is the short argument? Two opposite corner cells of a chessboard always have the same color and every domino covers one white and one black. And so if you would try to do this, uh, this will actually uh, leave you with two whites, no matter how you do this, All right? Now, um, some interesting thing is if you, now, because the nice thing about this, this proof rule is not only that it allows you to have these proofs, one of the cool things that it revealed is all the kind of additional reasoning that you can do in a solver uh, because we now, okay, what is redundancy and how can we use this to actually make this, the reasoning in the solver stronger and stronger? And if you would have this example over here and you would apply uh, conflict analysis as described in a couple of talks here, then what it will give you is so it says, okay, this assignment is uh, uh, the one that, that you should block. 
So all, everything else is actually is forced by unit propagation. And so you get a clause with uh, 14 literals. If you go to kind of a stronger version, actually, with, which is allowed by the proof rule, then, uh, and so which, which, which we call SDCL, satisfaction driven clause learning, what it gives back is actually this. It says, this is the reason why uh, the prior assignment was wrong. And you think, okay, how is that possible? Why, why, why this too, right? But the thing is that the reasoning here is, imagine that we have these two horizontal ones on top of each other. And if there would be a way to finish the whole thing, then there is another way to solve, to solve the problem by replacing the two horizontal ones by two vertical ones. And as a consequence, we can block two horizontal ones on top of each other here and everywhere on the grid. And so, and this can be also easily be expressed using the single proof rule. And more, more specifically, so if we have the pattern uh, two horizontal dominoes on top of each other, we can replace them by two vertical ones and therefore block all two horizontal ones on top of each other everywhere. And if there are two vertical ones with a horizontal one on top, we can replace them by two vertical ones and one horizontal one below it. If we block that pattern as well, the number of cases goes from exponential to linear and we are done. And one of the key things that I, I noticed been solving uh, lots of, of uh, math problems is that the computer is uh, so automated reasoning has a severe difficulty coming up with the chessboard pattern. This is a very complicated thing to come up with. However, coming up with these kind of local things, it's much easier. And so the reasoning, so it is able to come up with a linear time argument for this kind of problems, but it's completely different from uh, what uh, uh, humans would come up with. Although for humans, it's still understandable what's going on. Yeah. So I figured this out after looking at the proof that the solver gave. Um, just to kind of uh, also uh, refer back to what Randy said in the morning, uh, this problem can also easily be solved uh, using uh, <coughs> BDDs. Um, and one of the cool things is also that Randy pointed out, everything that this can be done in a BDD solver uh, can be easily expressed using the same proof rule. Right? So although it's a completely different way of solving problems, Again, this can easily be expressed using the single proof rule. So the other challenge was the following. Okay, now we have the single proof rule. Now, how are we going to check this? Because do we want to give a little, uh, so there you could add a lot of hints to this why the clause is redundant. But what we decided to do is, okay, we have this single proof rule. Everything that is kind of learned by the solver can be expressed by the sequence of these of these uh, of this redundancy. But how are we going to check this efficiently? And uh, because actually providing the details was very costly. So the uh, so the resolution proofs in the earlier work, producing them was very costly. So what we decided to do is okay, we don't put the burden of the details uh, by the solver. What we're going to do is the Checker needs to provide all the details. If you allow, if you ask the checker to provide all the details, then the cost of checking explodes. How are we able to deal with this? So we are able to deal with this is by the important observation here, which was already kind of mentioned in, uh, by, in, by Goldberg in 2003, is we can reason backwards. So the solver, so say blue is the, your formula, and red is all the clauses that are learned by the solver. And what we can do is we, at some point, the solver derives the empty clause, and we don't need to check all of the red. Right? The only thing we need to check is that we are able to reproduce the empty clause. How are we going to do this? So we start with the empty clause, and then we ask, OK, what was required for the empty clause? And the interesting thing is the, the, the proofs that we have don't include any hints. And this is actually an advantage. 
Because if you would look at what the solver gave, what the solver derived to get the empty clause, and you start reasoning backwards, then you get a quite a big green part. But now we have the flexibility to, okay, we have the empty clause and there's a lot of clauses the solver learned. How can we reason backwards such that the things we need to check is as small as possible? And you can do all kinds of heuristics to really make the green part as uh, very small. And for many problems, the green part is just 1% of the, of the, of the, the solvers produced by, by, the sol by the solver. And thereby you can make the proof checking uh, reasonably uh, cheap. Yeah, so these were the, 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 the two key ideas. First, have a single proof rule and second, we are able to check things efficiently by doing the backwards reasoning using all kinds of heuristics. And so this is the uh, kind of now the current status is that we have formally verified checkers for this uh, uh, for these strong proof systems, and we don't have to worry about the correctness or completeness of the proofs. We are only going to check for each result from the solver whether uh, uh, whether the result is correct. And I spoke to various uh, solver developers and they said, okay, they're now daring to kind of make the solvers more and more complex because they can check, uh, yeah, they, you, they you can use the tools for debugging and as a consequence, the solvers have become even more efficient. And so we can have now full uh, confidence in the results and these checkers are also used in industry. Just to kind of give you a uh, feeling of kind of how, how this is used. So uh, also for many of the, the, the math problems that I've been working on, uh, this is kind of the typical tool chain I have. So we have the original problem and first we encode this somehow into a propositional formula. This uh, so far is typically the only part that is not verified. Uh, and because it's not verified, we want to have this as simple as possible to, to, have, to have most confidence that this part is correct. So we end up with our original formula, but because this is typically not the easiest thing to solve, we want to transform it into a formula that's easy to solve or easier to solve. And so what we do is we massage the encoding in such a way that it becomes much easier to solve. So the, the problem I also explained two weeks ago, we did a complete change of the encoding, this radical change of the encoding, uh, which is way more complicated, but allowed us to have a, a factor 100 speed up. Right? So this part is done in the re-encoding proof, and then we solve the problem, which gets us a refutation. We combine the re-encoding and the refutation, then we optimize it such that it's easy for the formally verified checker, and then we check it with the formally verified checker. And so this is the approach I've mostly been taking, even for the Pythagorean triples. You write a seven line C program that generates this, then we re encode it to get something which is easier to solve, and then uh, we construct the entire proof. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so I already mentioned this, uh, uh, these kind of topics. Okay, now let's go beyond proof validation. So we can now construct these proofs, we can check them to be correct, but can we get other things out of it? Can we get some insight out of it? I want to explain this using uh, the chromatic number of the plane. So what is this problem? So we have all the points in the two dimensional space and there's only one constraint. If two points have exactly distance one, they must have a different color. So how many colors do you need? So this problem was already kind of the uh, studied uh, around the 1950 and already kind of in the late forties, early fifties, these results were known. Namely, you need at least four colors and at most seven colors. What is the argument? So you have these seven points in the plane shown over here with 11 distances one. And this graph known as the Moser spindle 
has chromatic number four. If there are already seven points, then it must at least hold for the, for the entire plane uh, uh, that you have this lower bound. And the upper bound comes from a tiling of the plane using hexagon tiles with the hexagon slightly smaller than outer radius than one, such that two points within a tile, there cannot be two points within a tile, and two tiles of the same color are further apart than them. Yeah. So this was already known in 1950, and it took uh, practically 70 years to make progress on this. And so Aubrey de Grey was the first one to find a uh, graph of 1581 vertices that has chromatic number five. And uh, so uh, when he got the result, he uh, uh, approached the media, the media approached Scott Arison, by then a, a colleague at, at UT Austin. And Scott said, okay, I'm not, uh, I cannot check this, but you can probably check this. And if you can check it, you can probably do better. <laughs> so uh, that's what I did in the, in the weeks afterwards. I tried to find smaller and smaller graphs uh, using, uh, with, uh, of com with commenting number five. And I was able to do this, and I will explain this in a couple, a couple of slides next, by looking at proofs. The proofs kind of allowed me to, to make smaller and smaller graphs. So let me go a bit into detail. So the first part was the validation. So there's two things that we need to do for validation. The first thing is that if you have two points, that you have to check that the distance is actually one, right? And this is, so, so Daniela, we did this uh, back then. So we uh, used the Grubner basis approach um, to, to make sure that the distance is exactly one. And this is kind of the typically how these points look like in the plane. The second part, of course, is that we need to check the chromatic <coughs> number. The chromatic number, we know how to check this, right? We make a formula. We ask if it's five colorable, that's easy. And we also ask whether there is no color, a uh, four coloring. And so we ask, is there a four coloring? And the answer should be unsatisfied. Now, the key thing to observe is that the unsatisfiable core, so all the clauses that uh, are required to prove unsatisfiability, they form another graph that has chromatic number five. Okay. All of the uh, vertices that are not mentioned in the proof or in the unsatisfiable core, they can be removed and you still have a chromatic number five. Yeah. Now, what I try to do, and so is, uh, how can we get the smallest unsatisfiable core? And I have been trying all kind of existing tools, but the existing tools completely broke down on this. Uh, and uh, how do you get a small one? And actually I implemented two algorithms. The first one is the one shown here. The second one is on the next slide and the second one works way better. But I just want to kind of give you some idea what my first approach was, what's what is shown over here. And uh, then how can we do better? So what we do is we start with our formula and we, uh, we want to output an unsatisfiable core. So we solve the formula, then we obtain a proof. Then there's all kinds of ways to optimize proofs. I don't want to go into detail here, but there's all kinds of ways to optimize proofs and make it smaller and smaller. And once we're kind of done with that, we can extract a core from the proof. And then we can use the core, we can solve the core again, get another proof, minimize the proof, and so on. Right? And at some point, there is no progress anymore, and then you give up. So this was my, the, the, the results I showed initially were based on this algorithm. We have, to, uh, we have somehow a very big graph with chromatic number five and we get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. One of the things that I noticed, and uh, that was also the, the reason why uh, Aubrey de Grey was not able to get smaller. If you, sometimes if you remove a clause, then the runtime of the solver can really explode. So if you give it a big graph, it maybe takes a couple of seconds. If you take away the wrong vertex, the runtime can go from seconds to hours. But it still has chromatic number five, but it, it becomes very expensive. And once you have hit such a vertex, you at some point you cannot really reduce it anymore. So 
one of the, the things I noticed, and this works actually uh, turned out to work really well, and it was kind of a big, uh, kind of an interesting um, observation, is the following. So we have our proof. We make it as small as possible. And uh, so, and then the interesting thing is, we are going to run this again. So optimize the proof again, but now with the original formula. So we first had, uh, and the, the key observation is that any proof for a subset of the formula is also a proof for the original formula. And the nice thing about this proof rule is that, uh, so for DRAT and other proof systems, is that you don't mention any hints. So it's a very general thing. And anything, all the proofs that work for, uh, yeah, so for a superset, for a subset is also working for a superset. And that way, what happens if you use this algorithm is that uh, you can extract, put, get clauses that are from the original formula, we can pull them back in to get smaller and smaller cores. Yeah, Bart? It's a property that, uh, well, it, if you have a subset, it also works for the, the whole set. Um, it assumes that you're not using your redundancy too much or not witnessing on, on variables too much. Yeah, no, so in this case, so uh, for, for the proofs here are, are just, uh, I, I use, res these are just uh, CDCL resolution ah, proofs. Okay. Yeah. So? The formula comes from graphs. Yeah. But you start with F that comes from a graph, but then F core also coming from another graph. No, 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 no. F core is 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 so F is is just the the, the uh, gr uh, graph encode of the graph coloring encoding of 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 uh, input graph, <coughs> and the core is just whatever clauses are mentioned in the proof. Well, no, the, the graphs disappear from the from the picture. Then I mean, you you you, you didn't find it. Your previous slide, it, it, it seemed to say that you had a graph of, of 810 vertices instead of 1500 vertices. Yeah. So, so where, where did that graph come from? Yeah, so I didn't want to kind of um, discuss where the, how, how I constructed the graphs, but the, the, the graphs have thousands of vertices, the original ones that we started with. And then we, that's our, our formula F is initially discussing thousands of vertices. And then we get down, down, down from them. But yeah, so since this is a talk about uh, uh, trust and proofs, I didn't want to describe all the ex complicated ways to, just do, to, to construct these graphs. Yeah, but so the core, so the core is just a subset of the clauses. So which means a subset of the edges and a subset of the vertices. Uh, and in, but in the end, what we have the when we extract uh, the subgraph, we just look at the the mentioned vertices in the in the in the, in the, in the final core. Kind of repeat uh, So, uh, are you going to say any more words on how you actually pull back the responses from F that are not in F core? So yeah, no. I, uh, let me. So the, the question is, how do you pull back clauses from uh, from the original formula? It's done fully automatic. I don't make any guidance. So what I, I do say, I, I run DRED trim using the proof and the, the the proof produced on the core, and I give it the same. I give the proof again to DRED trim, but with the original formula. And I use all kind of heuristics in DRED trim to make the, the, the proof smaller. And everything goes automatically because it, it just has a superset of the, of the, of the clauses. And it, it is able then to pull them back in. So you don't have any special heuristics for this? I have case? no special heuristics. So it's just, I just give it an, another input formula. And then it's able to, uh, to pull things back in, but without any guidance. There's, Any other questions? Now, just to give you uh, 
a little bit of an impression of how this this works is so this is uh, the number of iterations uh, and so with different seats I run this if you do the naive way then you get down to kind of uh, 500 for a, a part of the graph and you get substantially smaller if you use the option to pull back clauses back in and so uh, I was able to get smaller and smaller graphs by using this algorithm and I tried to find uh, use other tools to find small cores but none of the tools were able to get uh, even cores in the range of this and the algorithm I just showed is able to give you kind of what is it uh, to, if you run this for longer I guess it gives you about 50 clauses smaller or 50 vertices smaller graphs <clears throat> and especially for people that are interested in uh, in Maxat uh, and other play other uh, areas where cores are important uh, you can use this algorithm to get smaller and smaller cores and I think that 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 is also might be quite helpful for uh, applications such as Maxat. Nikolai. So there's a, a array of techniques used for core minimization that are not based on, on proofs. Are any of those techniques uh, would you be able to use any of those techniques in conjunction with what you do? So there's like just model rotation. Um, so I use the tools um, uh, that are available, but uh, so to compute and to compute an unsatisfiable minimal unsatisfiable core using existing tools, which use this model rotation and this, and and the the, the problem is with all these tools is at some point they they decide to take out a take out a clause and when they take out a random clause then the proof explodes and then the, re the resulting core will be large and so the, the issue is with all these techniques is that they somehow they're always relying on getting randomly picking out some clause that they remove instead of doing everything based on proofs because the, the nice thing here is that the proofs are always they're always small, right? They're they're actually kilobytes in size difference. And by keeping by following keeping this this procedure, you make sure that if you make a mistake anywhere, you can always kind of get back because you are able to pull back things back back in. But yeah, no. If you I'm if you're able to 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 get a smaller graph, I will be very happy if you could show that. I don't think so. In my experience, the other techniques don't work, and they don't combine. What? And they don't even combine. No, no, they do compound. What do you mean? Combine. Oh, combine. combine. Um, I don't know how how to how to combine this. Uh, I'm asking you. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Maybe you could improve generic tools for minimal and satisfiable core extraction with these techniques based on course yeah based on proofs yeah no i think i think uh i'm hopeful that that is also why i included this topic because there are several marks of people in the room right uh that i think this could be quite helpful uh there because the, as at least in my experience is that other existing techniques are not able to get these kind of cores. I'm sorry, I, I, I feel dumb, but uh, you, you, you're you talking about a core which consists of clauses. Yeah. And then you're talking about graphs which have vertices. Yeah. But then we also have colors. Yeah. And, and, and the clauses have to do with colors. And, not, and then you say you added 131 vertices. To, yeah, OK. Uh, so so, so I, I, I don't see, you know, you, you're removing clauses in order to get a small core. Yeah. But 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 then then what you uh, you, you remove a vertex because it no longer appear, appears in any of the clauses or something? Yeah. So uh, the the classical uh, so the graph coloring encoding that I use has for each vertex it has at least one color, and for every edge for every uh, edge that the, the, the two vertices mentioned cannot have the same color. So as soon as a, a clause that says each vertex has to have at least one color is no longer in the core, then you know that you can safely take that vertex out and still have the 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 the, the, the desired property. 
the desired property meaning meaning that they're all distance one. No, the desired property meaning chromatic number five. So then why do you have to add 131? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so actually I yeah, no, this is the I, I see the, the confusion here. Uh, the thing is that I split the graph into two because I am able to 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 minimize the, the, the parts independently. But yeah, so uh, I let me just let let's ignore that that part. So I'm actually minimizing two two uh, graphs at the same time that I can combine. So and uh, this is the smallest graph I was able to produce so far. So I got down to five hundred and ten. Um, which is vertex critical only the middle one for example has the fifth color and everything else has uh, the other four colors and so the lines denote distance one so this is distance one and what you kind of see in these kind of smallest examples is that uh, vertices that are close to each other tend to have the same color right which looks a bit like the the, the original tiling but of course we just have here <coughs> Four colors plus the fifth color for just a single vertex. Yeah, and yeah, I'm. If anybody, so I'm. I'm still quite hopeful that we at some point get to chromatic number six, and I'm working on this. Uh, uh, and I have several ideas, maybe how to get it. But I think this is also an important challenge for automated reasoning. Can we get to chromatic number six? And I think it should be doable. Chromatic number seven seems to be completely out of reach uh, for several reasons, but six, I, I think, is probably doable. Okay, let's go to the next topic. So, this was kind of another math problem that I uh, looked into um, is uh, Keller's conjecture. What's Keller's conjecture is we have square tiles, all of the same size, and we want to have a, a tiling of the two-dimensional space without gaps. And the question is, can we do this while avoiding that two adjacent tiles fully share an edge? If you think about it, then the only way of doing this is to put a gap-free tiling, is to put the tiles into lanes. Lanes can be shifted arbitrarily from each other, but two tiles within a lane fully share an edge. Right? That's also shown over here. So we have lanes, but two tiles that are in the same lane adjacent fully shared. We can ask the same question for the three dimensional case. So we have cubes all of the same size and we want to do a, a, a tiling of the three dimensional space such there's no gaps. Now I try to do this here using uh, a couple of cubes, but the the faces you see over here, the blue ones, the only way that I can continue is to make them fully share the face. And so it, it, you need to think about it slightly longer, but then you also come to the conclusion that the only way of doing this is that there are cubes that fully share a face. Now Keller conjectured in 1930 that this happens for all dimensions. So it's not only one, two, and three, but for all dimensions, it's holds that if you have n-dimensional cubes and you tile the n-dimensional space without gaps, <coughs> then you always have an n minus one uh, dimensional face uh, sharing between two cubes. And we were able to solve this problem using uh, SAT, and this, is, this, this problem seems way more uh, different, right? Because how are we going to, this is a continuous styling problem. How are we going to discretize it? And so we were able to do this building on top of a lot of work that has been done uh, over the century that this problem is out. Um, and so the conclusion was here that the conjecture holds up till dimension seven, and it breaks at dimension eight, and end up as soon as you have a counterexample for a certain dimension, then that is a counterexample also for all, all higher dimensions. So I won't talk about how we how we were able to encode this, 
but you can imagine that this is way more tricky than the Pythagorean triples. And uh, the key thing is so, how can we be sure that everything that we did, because it was also a big computation, how can we be sure that this result is correct? And so, because we, this is a continuous styling problem, so how do we discretize it? Then there is this, the key symmetry breaking depends on that the conjecture holds for the prior dimension. How can we kind of make sure that, okay, that holds, right? And then the encoding was complicated. But so our solutions, and so I think this is an important thing for future things, is that we validate everything, but we need to do this, uh, for example, with uh, in, in the theorem proof. <coughs> so uh, Josh Kloon uh, formalized the discretization of the problem. So this has been, there's a lot of work in this, and he formalized the entire argument going from the continuous statement to the Keller graphs. Uh, we need kind of a, a verified way of, and that's a student is now working on this. If we have an unsought result from one formula, what does it mean for another formula? And how can we make sure that the results from one formula, if we know this is unsought, what can we derive from this for the other one? So how do we do communication between sought results? And the same student is also working on uh, verifying the encoding. And I think it is important. So this, these are things though that cannot be expressed in with the single proof rule, right? This is all kind of on the higher level. Yeah? And to be sure that these, these map results are, uh, that we can fully trust them, we need this one, these results verified as well. Cool deep. So uh, what do you mean by verifying the encoding? Uh, you, you have a problem statement in what language and? So What's in this, in this case, so I, I I don't didn't talk about but what the the problem in the end is a, a question about does a certain graph have a C clique of another of a certain size, and um, but it's more complicated than that. But so we have a statement in Lean that describes this this problem, and then we uh, uh, produce the propositional formula. That and then we show that this that if this is unsatisfiable, then the clique does not exist. Uh, so a statement like a first or and then for dimension eight. Oh, so uh, don't mention that for dimension eight. It's not required. So the but uh, your point is that once there is a counterexample, right? That counterexample uh, can be checked efficiently. Uh, uh, but the same as any SAT result can, can be checked efficiently. But the key thing is that the, that it does hold for dimension seven was the, 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 big, the biggest uh, combinatorial problem. So just so that I understood. So you have like a first order sentence and you are trying to verify whether you yeah. encode, whether you're grounded into the proposition formula yes. correctly. And so I think this is um, really important. Eh? Also, uh, if we want to kind of convince others that these, we, we can solve these, these big open math problems, especially if we go beyond kind of uh, natural kind of combinatorial problems, uh, we need to also ver validate the encoding and uh, which has typically multiple things. And this, I think all three of them will typically be part of that is that we need to uh, discretize it. We need to probably do some communication between formulas and we need to verify the encodings. Now, there's another thing that I wanted to talk about uh, based on the discussions we had on Saturday, Don and I, um, about the uh, end queen graph. So the graph has uh, n square vertices corresponding to each of the cells of, of the n by n board and um, chessboard and two, there's an edge between two cells if they, if queens on those cells can attack each other. Yeah. Or if you can see it, if, if you, you can get from a queen from one cell to the other one. Uh, so most people uh, have been looking into the problem. Okay, can we put queens on there? But you can also ask this graph, whether, what, what is the chromatic number of this graph? 
And so here's a, a five by five one, which can be, you, you just need uh, five colors, right? And the, the five, so N, for the N queens, it's clearly that you need at least N ones because you need to have N on every row, column, and diagonal. Um, so what's the chromatic number? And so you see that for most of them, it is uh, the same. But for some of them, it's it's slightly it's one higher. So you you you, you need uh, n plus one colors. And I have been looking at all kind of. So I had a, a, a paper on graph coloring uh, last year at Flock, and these turned out to be out very difficult problems, right? To to show oh, that those eight not, but nine and ten are really challenging. And so we discussed this also. Um, and it turns out, and so this is a very cool idea, is about uh, clique hints. And so you can actually solve these problems now efficiently by the so-called clique hints. So what is a clique hint? Is that for every clique of size n, and so that means every row and every column and both diagonals, we know that every color needs to appear there, right? If we want to color it with n colors. And we can add this as constraints, right? We can add this, okay, uh, uh, orange needs to be here, orange needs to be there, right? Orange needs to be there. And, um, and yeah, this, so this is uh, a very elegant idea. And so I, I, I did not think about it in the past. Uh, and so I implemented this and now these problems actually become easy. So, and if you imagine what happens now, if you don't have these clauses, so, uh, somehow the assignment says, okay, in this row, there cannot be any orange, right? Somehow with your existing assignment, then you end up with a pigeonhole format, right? Because one color is out and you need, and, but you might be able, the solver will might try to, to, to fix it, right? And so you end up with, as soon as one color is excluded from every click, you uh, might be solving a pigeonhole format. And um, so, but now, so also why I wanted to, uh, to mention this, okay. These are very powerful clauses. So for example, for eight, it goes from a, a four seconds say to, to zero to two seconds, but uh, I'm now able to solve all of them. So for 10, it is now, I can do this now in, uh, I think in 40 minutes, but I was not able to solve 10 at all, right? Uh, and so you can, now solve these problems using these clauses, but how do I justify them, right? We, we can of course run, maybe do some pigeonhole or there's other, the other ways of doing this, but it's more in, 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 uh, in general, if we come up with very cool ideas of how to speed things up, how are we sure that, that these things are correct, right? And we probably also want to have some uh, uh, for verified statements that these things are correct. Yeah, and I really like this idea. So I'm, uh, I think there's more things that click hints can be useful for, for kind of all kind of graphs. And uh, so thanks so much for bringing this up. And so to, to conclude, um, proof logging is now mature in SATS. Uh, all the top tier solvers support it. Uh, we can even check these results with formally verified checkers. And as Randy also mentioned, there haven't been any issues with solvers in, uh, in the last couple of years, right? So solver developers are using them and we almost don't need to check the results anymore because the solvers, the tools are now highly trustworthy. Yeah, because everybody uses it. I do think that we need also, well, the community focuses on CNF formulas but in practice, because they, they, these, these CNF formulas come from somewhere, right? And if we really want to have full confidence in the result, we need also to verify that the encodings are correct and that we actually solve something on the original problem. And there's a lot of cool stuff in this area that all, I think there's some talks also later this afternoon, a lot of cool stuff trying to kind of generalize with proofs what's going on on SAT. We also now see it in SMT, in model counting, max SAT. And so this is the, 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 the paper from last year, but uh, Randy also mentioned that we have uh, making quite some progress also in this direction 
of formally verified mobile county. Um, that concludes my talk. Uh, thanks so much. All right, questions? Oh, yeah, there's another slide if, if, if there's time. Actually, two more slides, but. Uh, <laughs> slide 30 was the second. No, 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 this slide 32. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this is the, one of the slides I wanted to show you. Uh, so, this is, we run uh, all of the winners. So, this is the winners from 2002, from the first sub competition to 2020. This is the winners of the main track or uh, the industrial track. And we ran them on all the benchmarks of the 2020 competition. <coughs> And so how to read this plot for anybody who doesn't have seen this before. So if this is the timeout, how many problems would you have solved? And so what you see here, for example, Limet was able to solve slightly more than 50 problems in 5,000 seconds. Uh, while uh, Kisset was able to do the same thing in say a couple of hundred seconds or maybe two or 300 seconds. And so what I also did here is I sorted the solvers based on the performance on the 2020 suite. And you see it's almost chronologically ordered, right? And what you do see, of course, uh, you take another set and it's there's a slight shuffling, but what you see here is that there is <coughs> clear progress. Yeah? None of these solvers have seen the benchmarks, right? Uh, we have 300 benchmarks that are completely new and 100 benchmarks from uh, say from the 6,000 that have been used in the prior competitions. Um, and I think this is a really cool thing that, that we have these plots for multiple competitions. And what you see is that if you sort things based on the number of benchmarks they solve, it's almost a chronological sort. And so there has been steady progress. Um, and we and if you look at the competition reports that, that, that the organizers that have made, we frequently also are able to pinpoint kind of what are the technique or techniques that really were able to uh, to improve things. So um, I think I think this is pretty compelling evidence that there has been progress over the years. <laughs> <laughs> I never doubted the progress. I am still saying that I have to go and look somewhere to figure out why Kisat twenty twenty was able to have such a, such a jump. Yeah. Do you know why? What, what particular feature in Kisat was the reason for this? That's what I'm... Yeah, no, so I think local search was, was an important thing, what Mate also pointed out. Uh, so local search was important here, but Kisat is also uh, the implemented much more efficiently okay. than the... Implementation. Right? Yeah. No, no, but I think the local search, but there's all kinds... Kisat is... Okay. I, I, I don't remember this too well, but he, he, he changed the data structures uh, based on his experience. So, so he, he knew where the fat was in previous. It, it, it wasn't only algorithm change, but, but it was also just uh, his intimate knowledge with, with the performance of the previous implementations. <clears throat> yeah, although I think the algorithmic improvements were much more important than the, 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 the implementation details. But of course, you all know that Armin is able to, uh, to, to implement yeah. things better than everybody, except maybe the... <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I do know, I mean, one of the things was this diversification. And so one of the things was this diversification and intensification that, that, that I believe Armin was sort of on top of at this point uh, and got it right, kind of. Um, this is this thing with VCs versus VMTF. Uh, so VCs is not the only one going around town now. So there's this VMTF versus VCs, um, and also a, a commensurate change in resource strategy and polarity heuristic, uh, which also came together with local search. So they, they do integrate interact with each other in sometimes unknown ways, and that is right that we need to look into that. But there's more than just it's more than just getting the data structures right. So there's some like real work here. I, I, I think he also left out some other improvements that that weren't pulling their weight, uh, and that's actually give, give a speed up in time because it was taking time to to, to make improvements. But but okay, uh, while I've got the mic, 
<laughs> I just want to say you you were too kind to me about this at Clickins because I got the idea of Clickins from a, a man in Japan, mm. uh, and and I I improved his idea slightly, but 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 in the wrong direction because because I was using a different encoding, mm. and, and, and and so I converted it into something complicated I called double Clickins. Mm. And I showed double click hints to you, and you simplified it and, and, and made an order of magnitude improvement. So yeah. you give me too much credit. I don't know. I thought it was a very natural step, step, the next step. But I, yeah, I would never have come up with it if you didn't bring it up. And I think, yeah, so the, the, the double, the, the, okay. <laughs> Other questions? So in one of your slides, you, uh, you showed that. You'd re-encode the problem and then you validate yeah. the re-encoding. <clears throat> so in the talk that you gave a couple of weeks back, yeah. the and that was a very, very different re-encoding, right? Yeah. So how, how do you validate? I mean, from an original encoding, which was, was completely different. So in this case, we so um yeah. Please, so we have the Stakas paper, which is also uh, on my website, but it's just, uh, you can express the entire, although you can, if you have the original encoding, you can have the new encoding is you can just have, is everything is implied by, or implied by DRED, can be checked by DRED, and then you can just drop the, everything that was no longer necessary from the original encoding. So DRED allows you to just uh, reformulate it in a very straightforward manner. So, so you're saying the the new encoding is kind of derivable from the yeah. original encoding, if you know the right. Yeah. So there is a you need to have the right order in which you add the clauses, but the entire uh, re-encoded formula can be added without any auxiliary clauses if you add them in the right order. And uh, in my experience, it's, that's frequently possible to have the optimized encoding or the re-encoded one. It's just, you can add them with DRED steps, uh, and typically without any auxiliary clauses. Last question, perhaps? Okay, so if you want to know, because actually I have another backup slide. <laughs> Um, this was this Quanta article was out today on the on that uh, that problem. Uh, so and it's uh, it kind of also describes kind of how the, the background story of that problem. So that the one that I uh, discussed. Uh, so if you look Google that, I guess it's already also check. Uh, you Google can probably find it after a couple of hours. So. <laughs> okay. Thank, okay you so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah, I read the song. Yes.